Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this evening. My name is Pierce Paul Kreef, and it's truly my pleasure to, to introduce our speaker this evening. But before we do so, I just need to say a few words about the American Center of Research. I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to keep in touch with us. Uh, so I will go through and point out some of these options. Of course, you see here, we're grateful that you've joined us during our lecture series. We've got our next lecture will be March 17th at 7 p.m. Amman time. We hope that you can join us for that as well. In the interim, please don't be shy to stay in touch with us in many, any number of other ways. Uh, uh, call to your attention perhaps the best way to hear about new programming, publications, and opportunities is by joining our electronic mailing list. You can see at the location here at the bottom of the screen. It's up to you how often you'd like to hear from us. For most folks, we recommend subscribing to our monthly update where you receive all of the information in one single news package. Of course, you can find us and follow us on social media, media and I would especially recommend our YouTube channel for the latest recorded presentations uh, where this one will end up uh, in not such a distant future, for which we're grateful to have uh, a nice catalog of those and hopefully to keep you interested and informed. We do have a couple of other opportunities in the mix. We're doing hiring, so if anybody's interested in careers with ACOR, please don't hesitate to visit our page at the link here uh, and consider those, uh, consider those possibilities with us. Now, of course, on to the reason why everybody is gathered here this evening. It's truly my pleasure to introduce Professor Ahmad Al-Jalan, a philologist, epigraphist, and historian of language, Professor and Ch Sophia Chair of Arabic Studies at Ohio State University. His work focuses on the languages and writing systems of pre-Islamic Arabia and the ancient Near East. And he's going to tell us some about those now, these ancient North Arabian inscriptions. Uh, we're very excited to hear from you tonight, sir. Thank you so much for joining us and to everybody. Uh, we're welcome to have you here, happy to have you here. Uh, Ahmad, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. We need you to unmute. We've got your video, we've got your screen. All right, All right. Uh, yes, you can hear me now, okay, perfect. So then, thank you very much. And uh, I think ACOR and the invitation of Dr. Kreisman and to uh, Ms. Salzinger uh, for her assistance with the technical issues and all the advertising. And I thank you all for uh, showing up uh, this early or this late uh, to attend this lecture. I'm uh, very excited to announce an important discovery from the 2019 summer campaign of the Badia uh, surveys in uh, northeastern Jordan, the, um, in the Black Desert. Uh, I'll be presenting today a new Safiitic inscription, which likely contains our earliest invocation to Jesus in the Arabic language, predating the Quranic text by centuries. And like all important discoveries, the text raises more questions than it can answer. So uh, let's go right now immediately to the Harra, where the text was discovered. Uh, the Harra is an Arabic term for the basalt desert that uh, stretches from southern Syria to uh, northern Saudi Arabia across the Jordanian panhandle. Uh, it's the result of volcanic activity millions of years ago and the spread of lava south over time, the lava broke up into basalt stones, and these uh, stones give rise to uh, the term the Black Desert, which is popular today. Uh, it, as you can see here, uh, is an appropriate name. And the, uh, the desert's really magnificent, uh, not for just its natural beauty, but because it's a treasure trove of archaeological remains. Uh, human habitation in the area stretches from the prehistoric period uh, until modern times, really, uh, continuous. And there's evidence for uh, uh, people everywhere, uh, campsites, animal enclosures, various stone installations. Here you have a, uh, the remains of a, uh, of a cairn and a, a tomb, a stone burial overlooking a, a wadi, uh, beautiful landscape indeed. But perhaps one of the most remarkable uh, features of the, uh, of the Harra are its inscriptions. You can see why, and, 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 there, and believe it or not, there are actually quite a few, uh, uh, well, we would say 
quite a few tens of thousands of texts uh, to be found in the Harra, and it's not hard to see why. Here you can see that the windy, uh, these winding wadis in good seasons and the rainy season will uh, produce herbage that will attract pastoralists and uh, from all around. It's a great place to pasture your animals uh, and to spend some time. You can see that uh, even uh, in this photograph, we have a stone enclosure. And it's not uncommon to find uh, fresh dung within these enclosures. So we see reuse and continued occupation until the present day. And as we go closer to areas where we find human habitation, um, this is where uh, one of the unique features of the Harra becomes apparent. Uh, sorry, one moment. The uh, inscriptions and rock art. If you look at this boulder here, I'll, I'll bring out the cursor, one moment. Uh, yes, if you see this uh, boulder, you can see immediately petroglyphs, images of animals. Here are some camels and some other animals that were carved uh, many, many centuries ago uh, by the local nomads, by the pastoralists. And in addition to that, you'll see on the right, uh, to the left of it and to the top, carvings of letters. In fact, this is here, this is, um, something that accompanies these rock drawings often are inscriptions in the term that we call in a, in a script that modern scholars have called uh, Safiric. It's one of the most peculiar witnesses to the region's past because in addition to the rock art, it gives us insights about the people who lived here, their life ways, and, uh, uh, and, and, and basically their own, uh, their local history. Uh, the script that you see here is a distinct variety of the South Semitic script. It's a family of alphabets used across the Arabian Peninsula in pre-Islamic times. And then the language it represents is also conventionally called Safiric. And in linguistic terms, it lies on the dialect continuum of old Arabic or pre-Islamic Arabic varieties. The language is very close to classical Arabic. Indeed, Michael McDonald, the great expert on the epigraphy of North Arabia, has, uh, has suggested that Safiric and classical Arabic may have even been mutually intelligible. And anyone who spent some time reading these inscriptions, you see that could very well be possible. Uh, nevertheless, Safiric has its own grammatical icy glosses that distinguish it from other closely related dialects. There are over 33,000 texts in the script uh, published and many thousands more have been discovered and await uh, publication. Okay? And so uh, we can see uh, here as we move on, uh, yes. Uh, the inscriptions of this area were also produced by local nomads within the script. Now, Safiric is just one of the scripts that we find in the Harra, the most numerous, we can say. There are many other types of alphabets uh, 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 that can be found in, in other languages, but the most numerous is the Safiric script, and these were produced by local nomads who had their own writing tradition that interfaced with their uh, customs and rituals and, their, and just their ways of life. And in many ways, the genre of the inscriptions are familiar to people who study epigraphy from other traditions like Roman epigraphy and Nabataean epigraphy. The, uh, the texts, uh, of course, uh, contain mostly onomastics, that is the personal names of the individuals who wrote these texts, but also uh, contain religious and commer commemorative inscriptions, building inscriptions, funerary inscriptions, and one inscription type that is perhaps uh, unique to the uh, Arabian cultural sphere, North Arabian cultural sphere, which is stopping and weeping. We know this genre from later Arabic poetry where poets will begin their, uh, their odes by stopping at a campsite and weeping and remembering loved ones. And indeed that is a very common uh, uh, textual genre that we find in Safiyadik where authors will stop at a, cops, at a campsite and remember uh, lost relatives and remember those who inhabited the area. But not just in oral form, they will commemorate their mourning with and, and their memory with an inscription. Okay. Now, because the inscription that we'll discuss today is religious, we don't have time to go through all of these categories, but we'll just look at what the Safiric inscriptions can tell us about the religious life of the ancient nomads. Uh, in general, they, many of these inscriptions give us information about their beliefs and their rituals, and it, the inscriptions reflect or suggest that the local nomads, indicate that the local nomads worshiped a large number of deities, uh, uh, local gods and as well as gods, as well as gods of, uh, of neighboring groups like uh, uh, Dusharai, the god of the Nabataeans, Baal Samin, who was worshiped in uh, the settled areas of the Hauran and the Palmyra, but as well local gods such as uh, Rufau uh, and uh, Yaitha or Alat. Now, uh, in addition to these uh, deities, 
uh, we have evidence for different rituals, uh, religious rituals such as animal sacrifice, dhabaha, erecting standing stones in commemoration of, uh, of, uh, of interaction with the deity, natab or nasab, uh, pilgrimages, hagag, even burnt offerings, aslaya, or um, and various other births. Uh, and so far, with the corpus of over 30,000 inscriptions, there is no evidence for the practice of monotheism or in monotheisms. There's no evidence for uh, local Jewish tribes, and there's certainly, uh, as of yet, no evidence for Christianity. So I'll give you a, uh, a kind of example of the, of, of the better example of the kind of religious uh, text and religious vocabulary that we can get in these inscriptions. So KRS uh, 68 uh, records a, which you have here as a photograph, but not a very good one on the slide, unfortunately, uh, records a, uh, a prayer, a religious act, a sacrifice and prayer to a deity called Sheikh Haqqawm. Sheikh Haqqawm is a uh, perhaps leader of the army, leader of the hosts, leader of the people, uh, a deity worshipped uh, by the Nabataeans and as well uh, worshipped locally. And this the, the individual, the author of this text, uh, he sacrifices a camel and then he makes a short prayer. Uh, so uh, you are the one he seeks in his path and through your guidance comes deliverance fultan from death. Mimot. Now, the, my vocalization of Safiyyadik is based on uh, the study of the of the inscriptions themselves and as well as Greek transcriptions of the language. So it sounds a little bit different than classical Arabic, but I think most who do know classical Arabic wouldn't have a hard time understanding what I just said. Now, I've, uh, so we, we have evidence that these, basically we have a, a window into their religious life and it is overwhelmingly, uh, we, we can call local Arabian uh, uh, paganism. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for lack of a better term, there's probably uh, better ways to put that. Now. I have not said anything about chronology yet. And that is because the chronology of Safiyadik is rather unclear. We don't know the chronological limits of Safiyadik. That is when the inscriptions began to be produced and when uh, they ceased. The uh, conventional dating, conventional dating given by scholars is that the inscriptions uh, begin around the first century BCE and end around the fourth century CE. And this is based on a small number of dated inscriptions uh, whose dates we can understand. So the Safiyyadic writers did not use a fixed calendar with numbered years. Rather, they dated their inscriptions to local events, the year so-and-so died, the year, the year of drought, the year of rains. And those types of dates, we just simply, we, we cannot locate in time. We cannot know when those events took place and which years those refer to. But sometimes we get dates like, the year the king of Nabatia died, or the year uh, uh, Caesar announced the province. And these seem to point towards the Nabataean and Roman period. And therefore, the, it is suggested that the Safiyadic inscriptions were produced in this period. But it is based, again, on a small number of dated texts. And, in, and indeed, we don't know when the tradition of writing begins. Archaeological uh, evidence uh, from the surveys of uh, Peter Ackerman suggests that they could push the date back to the third century BCE, um, but it's truly unclear. And the end date for the inscription, the terminus ad quem, is based on the absence of references to Christianity. That is the whole, that is so, so it is an argument from absence, in fact. Um, and, so, uh, and maybe it's a good one as well, but it's still, uh, we don't really have any good evidence for when the inscriptions uh, do end. It's a conventional uh, end point. Now, uh, the, there have been others in the past, there have been a few claims, and I'll just treat one, of Christianity in the ancient North Arabian inscriptions. Uh, and all of these claims are rather dubious. So, for example, one very popular one was a reading of an inscription by Eno Littman, uh, published in 1950. You have here a, uh, a cross, this comes from Wadi Ram, and beneath it he read in the Hismaic script a Yod, a Sheen, and a Ain, which he took to be as Yeshua. It's an ingenious uh, reading of this very poorly, uh, poorly carved section. But in fact, when you look more closely at this image, we see that, there, that this line here, that this bar that is meant to be part of the Yod is also Part, uh, you have another line here, and it could very well be damaged. But more interesting is that I, when I was visiting uh, uh, Qasr Kharana, 
2019, one of the famed desert castles of Umea. And when you go inside, it's filled with graffiti and markings. And I find the same sequence there, a very similar sequence. And these, um, in, in Qasr Kharana, this sequence here is simply a tribal mark, a wesem. It's a mark, a tribal mark has nothing to do with Christianity and is probably relatively modern. And it seems that that's in fact what is occurring here. It's just a tribal mark and it is not the reading of, uh, not the name Jesus at all. And so uh, with this aside, and there are a few others that are basically of the same quality, there have been no, there's been no evidence in any of these inscriptions for Christianity or mentions of Jesus or mention of events that occur after the fourth century. So the end date seems rather reasonable. Now, the text that I'll present today may change that story. Uh, the text was discovered during the 2019 campaign of the Badia surveys led by myself and my colleague uh, Ali al-Manasir with the generous support of the Hassan Research Center in Abu Dhabi uh, by, uh, led by Zuhair al-Qali. Our survey lasted two weeks as we covered dozens of sites in northeastern Jordan. And on the 20th of June, the team discovered what turned out to be a remarkable site near a seasonal watering hole, which you can see here. So our activities is, uh, were up here, in northeastern Jordan, and this is the site, and from, the top, from this uh, image, you can see the watering hole, we'll make it a bit larger. We were surveying in this wadi here, and then we reached a point where we wanted to meet, our cars were parked in the, uh, uh, in the bed of this dry lake. And so we cut across uh, to meet them. And as we did, we followed an, a footpath, the pre one that already existed, which turned out to be a very ancient footpath, and you can already see it here. And it leads right by a small cairn. Right? And as we followed this footpath, we came to the cairn, and the cairn was, uh, which looks like this, nothing too exciting, but it was filled with inscriptions, hundreds of inscriptions uh, surrounding the cairn, and mostly in the Safedic script, um, but also in the Greek script, I'll show you uh, right here, you have even uh, Greek inscriptions there. So this was a, a, a site that many people were coming to, and the reason was, in fact, the dry lake bed that we, we see right next to it was in former times, of course, filled with water. And it was called by many of those who wrote the Safiid inscriptions an Athayat, Athayat, which simply means a, a pond in Safiidic. And the Safiidic writers recorded stopping at this place and taking their animals to the pond and exploiting the pond, okay? And it seems that uh, the same reason would have attracted uh, anyone passing through the desert, okay? Um, Let's see. Yes. Uh, and one of the texts among the many, many inscriptions that we discovered here was one text that was unique. It was carved in a kind of script style. It was very different than the uh, other uh, texts that we discovered. Um, and it was carved on a movable solitary stone. It made no reference to the pool. I can't show the entire photograph yet because the inscription isn't published. We hope to publish it this year. Um, but I have uh, given you a section here of the uh, relevant portion, right? Um, the invocation. So the entire text reads something like this. Li Wahbel bin Gayas bin Abbas bin Ahbab bin Rafat bin Abat bin Khal bin Qatat bin Zanban. That's his genealogy, a man named Wahbel, and he gives his ancestors 10 generations or so. He grieved for his maternal uncle, the Ashlalite. This is typical Safiyyah not very uh, remarkable in any way. And then the invocation, which you can see very clearly here for those of you who know the Safedic script. Ha ain saya, unsurhu or unsuru min kafirika. Help him, which I suggest the translation, O ain sinya, help him against those who deny you. Now, we'll talk about how to make sense of this text in the next slide. But immediately, the formula shows us that this form Ayn Sin Ya is in the position of the deity, it's being invoked. And that, and in Safiric, this consonantal skeleton, Ayn Sin Ya, is compatible with classical Arabic uh, spelling of Isa, okay? Whereas in classical Arabic, you write the long vowel internally with a Ya. In Safiric, you do not mark internal long vowels. The, what we call the Alif Maqsura in classical Arabic which is really just a ya that we pronounce as an alif in normative classical Arabic pronunciation, and Safiric is always represented with a ya. There are phonetic, uh, phonological and phonetic reasons for that that we can discuss later, okay? So this form here is compatible with the Arabic ayn ya, sin ya, or isa. Hmm? 
So how do we determine exactly what this means? Well, Safedic writings, Safedic inscriptions are rigidly formulaic and these formulae give us an opportunity to understand the occurrences of new words and understand the syntax uh, or to understand the meaning of new combinations of words since they all follow the same or very similar syntax. So the invocation here follows an established uh, uh, formula for invocations where you begin with the vocative and the deity. Uh, here on the side, you have various ones, ha, and then the name of a deity, then an imperative verb, which can then be followed by a pronominal object introduced by H or, or, or a pronominal object that goes back to the author, that refers back to the author, and then the preposition me or min with assimilation, and then the, uh, um, and that introduces the matter for which the author is seeking help, okay? So here we have ha ye sallim agdaya min saqam, right? Oh ye keep my uh, kids, these are the animals, huh? uh, safe from illness, ha huh? Oh, Rudo, help him against enemies. Oh, Yaytha, help him against misfortune, against evil. Oh, Rudo, deliver him from enemies, and so on. So you see that the structure is established, and there are many, many, many inscriptions that follow this exact structure, and that is the exact formula that we have here. So we can break it down quite easily. Ayn Sin Ya is the deity. Nasara is the imperative verb. Ha refers back to the author. Mi is what he's seeking protection against. Kafara is the, the thing that, that, that he's seeking uh, his uh, help or protection from. And this Ka must refer back to the deity, right? So this is going back to the deity. Now, the collocation of these verbs, nasar and kafar, is indeed remarkable because these verbs do not occur in, um, uh, elsewhere together in Safiyyah. Now, in the remaining time, I cannot give a full survey of all the occurrences of the root nasara and kafara in the Semitic languages and their spectral meanings, but, like, but I'd like to focus on, on, this, on this very important fact of their occurrence here, Nasara and Kafara never appearing together in Safiyyidic across hundreds of prayers. Nasara is only known from, I think, two texts, and Kafara is attested here for the first time. And we have, of course, it's, uh, we, we see that the pair occur together, for example, in the Quran, in uh, 3, 1, 4, 7, one surna ala al-qawm al-kafirin, and help and grant us victory over the disbelieving host. And uh, even with a direct object. So usually in the Quran, kafara, kafara bi, it takes an object introduced by bi. But in uh, extra Quranic material, kafara can take a direct object. So for example, in this, um, in what is uh, used today is dua uh, al-qunut al-witr, which uh, has its origins in the controversial law, surat al-khala, la nakfuruka wa nu'minu bika. We do not deny you, we do not believe in you, but we, uh, uh, but we believe in you, we, we do uh, um, uh, no, the contrary, right? Um, and so, and of course, this uh, usage is reminiscent of uh, Syriac usage as well. In fact, um, the semantics of kafra in Arabic to deny are thought to derive from Syriac usage. That is a meaning originates in a Christian context. And so while kafra exists in Arabic already, its original meaning um, and this is the meaning that you find across the Semitic languages, is to cover or to conceal, but not to, for example, deny uh, faith. And here we have a, uh, a, a nice example in Syriac, Agfar Bedhilta de Natraye. Okay, so let us uh, go Edenize the uh, Christianity, the Nazarene faith. All right, um, so then let's move on. So then how do we try to identify this uh, 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 a divine name, Ayn Sin Ya, given the context that we've just presented and, and seeing how that's strongly reminiscent of, of, of Christian usage, how do we define uh, or how do we try to identify Ayn Sin Ya? Now, its compatibility with Isa is important, but at the same time, uh, uh, we should be aware of the fact that Isa itself in classical Arabic, the name of Jesus, Isa in classical Arabic, does not have a convincing etymology. It does not derive through any normal processes from the uh, existing names of Jesus at the time. So, for example, the Hebrew Yeshua, in Syriac Yeshua or Ishua, uh, Greek Isus, uh, Ethiopic Iasus, none of these would produce Isa. 
it's possible through a lot of ad hoc changes to transform any of these into ISA, but those ad hoc changes um, reduce the likelihood of such an explanation. So for example, for the Greek isus, it has been said uh, that, uh, well, the Arabic added the ayn to the beginning of the word, which happens occasionally, but it's not regular. But then the second declension ending us is never rendered in Arabic with the final a, ah, much less a. Eh. So we would just have to say they did that just because. And those are the types of examples, those are the types of explanations that have been used, um, some of the better explanations, in fact, that have been used to explain how these uh, uh, pre existing names for, uh, for Jesus became Isa or Isa, depending on the um, reading tradition one wishes to use in the, in, uh, when uh, performing the Quran. Now, I, I noticed a while back that at least a name that is consonantally compatible with Isa exists in Safiyyidic, and it even exists in, the, in, in pagan inscriptions. So for example, in this inscription here, uh, we have a short text with a prayer, li qadim bin, and then you have an sinya, wa ha rathaw awwisul, o rathaw, grant him a boon, right? So it's a prayer to a uh, pagan deity with a person named an sinya. So a very simple hypothesis would be that this was a pre-existing name in the Arabic of the area that when the uh, that, that when the when these Arabic speakers became Christian that they equated this name with the name of Jesus. Now there are parallels for this. For example, the Arabic name for John, Yohanan, which uh, is given in Arabic as Yahya or Yahye. Okay, these. Uh, oops, sorry. This. Uh, go uh -huh. yeah which is given in arabic as yahya or yahya uh this does not derive from this is not the result of simply importing yohanan into arabic and pronouncing it with an arabic accent or or or, or rendering it with arabic phonology but rather yahya or yahya is a pre-existing arabic name indeed already tested it attested in safiyyidic in pagan inscriptions and it seems that when arabic speakers uh, adopted this name into Arabic when they uh, they equated it with a pre-existing name. So rather than simply bringing Yohanan over, they equated Yohanan with a name that already existed in their onomasticon, which was Yahya. The same process could in fact apply to Jesus. Yisur or Yeshua was not brought over in this strand of Arabic and other kinds of Arabic it was, of course, but in this strand of Arabic, it was not brought over phonetically, but rather equated with a pre-existing name, Isa, okay, or Isa. Now, with that said, it still leaves the etymology of Isa open. There's no consensus among uh, uh, the uh, uh, classical exegetes and medieval Arabic grammarians and lexicographers as to what Isa means. Many have suggested it is a foreign name. Others have tried to derive it from Arabic roots meaning white, but there's no consensus. I'd like to suggest here a etymology that may have motivated this uh, uh, equation. The root, it may not come from a root that we find in the, um, uh, in the classical Arabic dictionaries. I would suggest that the meaning of the name, okay, Isa actually made it attractive, especially attractive as a way to render Jesus into Arabic. The root Asaya, as I said, is not productive in classical Arabic, but is found in older Arabian languages and in Ge'ez. And it seems in the Safiyyidic lexicon, if we look at the, per at the um, personal names, means something like to purchase, okay, to acquire, to purchase. And so I would suggest that Isa is a, a fayal pattern, which is an agentive pattern, right, in Arabic, a productive agentive pattern, uh, meaning the doer of something, um, to mean the purchaser or purchaser, right? Uh, the name would be uh, similar, uh, would have had a similar meaning to the modern Arabic name Fadi, which is one who ransoms or one who purchases, right? And in that sense, Isa, it's literal, if that is the correct etymology, it would literally mean the redeemer or a redeemer, a possible loan equivalent, not translation of the Greek title, uh, for example, Soter or Syriac Paropa, it would be seen as an equivalent on that. The focus on the redemptive aspect of salvation in the Arabic name or epithet may be deliberate. The pagan gods were frequently invoked for deliverance, yet they never pay or sacrifice anything in order to save their worshiper. This would have been a unique quality of Christian salvation. As such, the epithet could have served to distinguish Christ as a redeeming savior from the older pagan gods. Indeed, Christ's sacrifice as redemption is expressed in several of Paul's letters and is a universal aspect of Christian theology. 
Now we can also take an alternative uh, view and see, uh, uh, come up with a different uh, uh, etymology and connect it to uh, uh, Hebrew asa or uh, the root meaning to make or do and take it as asa, a creator or doer. Um, but the sibilants don't quite work out there. So there's some sound correspondence issues. And again, um, such an explanation sort of, uh, it doesn't take into account the heavily Christian vocabulary of the invocation in which this name curse, right, and leaves our explanation of the name of Jesus also, uh, uh, well, leaves the name of Jesus in Arabic later without an explanation. So then, we come and try to build a historical context for this inscription. If the interpretation is correct, that this is indeed Isa, and this is indeed a Christian invocation, and build a pretty strong case for that, how did this come to be? Earlier literary, early literary sources record several accounts of Christian holy men venturing out into the deserts to convert its nomadic inhabitants. Perhaps one of the most famous descriptions belongs to Jerome with the, the, the uh, fourth, early fifth century, um, who recounts an encounter between St. Hilarion and the Arabs in Elusa. He describes the Saracens, so he describes them as devoted to the cult of the morning star, and stories of St. Hilarion's miracle working caused the nomads to flock to him, to receive blessings at which point he invited them to abandon the idols and worship God alone, that is, he converts them to Christianity. Now, Greek inscriptions left by men with Greek names can be found throughout the Hara, in the, in the most remote parts of the Hara. They're not many, but they're there. You can encounter them. For example, uh, the uh, photograph here, you see this was left by just a single name, somebody named Nestor uh, carved his name uh, here. Now, one wonders if some of these, like our Nestor, hmm? were carved by ascetics proselytizing to the nomads. There is so far only one Greek inscription that contains Christian devotional language discovered near Pasad Burpo, and this hasn't been published yet, but it is the, the same circumstances that would have led uh, to this kind of proselytizing in, in, in other places, for example, in the account uh, described by Jerome, would have uh, uh, been present in the Harra. And it's not hard to imagine that um, uh, people from settled areas in the Hauran, uh, uh, holy men from those areas or, or elsewhere, moving into the Harran, attempting to convert the local nomads in the same way. Wahbel could therefore have been, or Wahbel could therefore have lived at the period at the end of Safiatic documentation, let's say around the fourth century CE. His group may have converted to Christianity by the activities of, of, uh, of desert proselytizers. The fact that Jesus is invoked in a manner similar to the pagan gods, hmm, but which is simply different to, uh, let's say, vocabulary, could suggest that Wahbel simply modified his writing tradition to accommodate his new faith. Uh, Constantine Klein, who produced a fascinating stu study of these early literary accounts, suggests that the type of conversion described by Jerome was merely the grafting of the old, of the new upon the old. And that might, that might be what we are uh, witnessing here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you can, if you have further questions after the talk, you can write me at this address or, or visit my uh, website for further articles on uh, on the inscriptions and to give a broader context. And uh, and and hopefully we'll have this inscription published uh, this year uh, sometime. The article is, uh, is almost ready and should be coming out this year, uh, where I go into many of these issues in more detail. And I'm happy to discuss uh, the details with you in the uh, right now in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. I'll give the round of applause on behalf of everybody who's watching now. Uh, it's exciting stuff and we're extremely grateful that you're sh willing to share that with us uh, in advance of publication. I've got a, a couple of questions here and some of them are related to uh, a just general context for perhaps those of us who are, who are not so int intimately familiar uh, with this. About what time chronologically does Isa um, the, the name in Arabic generally become agreed to as referred to being Jesus? Well, you have you, the, uh, the earliest, let's say, uh, documentation of this name is in the Quran itself. Okay. okay? So it's in the Quran itself. Uh, and if you want to be very strict, then you would put that to the mid, uh, you would say you would look at the earliest manuscripts, which date to the mid seventh century. Okay. Uh, now, at the same time, Christian Arabic communities have another name for Jesus, which is Yeshua. And this is in fact, the Arabic pronunciation of the Syriac and Hebrew Yeshua, right? You would render it into Arabic as Yeshua. And that's sort of a different line, but that name Yeshua does not occur as the name of Jesus in the Quran. And, in, and it's the Quran that establishes the name of Jesus for Muslims as Isa. 
and that is the uh, name that uh, uh, that is that is the name that of course is used uh, by Muslims and within the Muslim tradition established by the Quran. Yeah. So this would be perhaps in previous previous thing I should say this. Most people have understood Isa to be a corruption or some kind of misunderstanding uh, uh, done uh, uh, and, and, and basically put it back to Muhammad himself. Muhammad heard it this way or misheard it this way. And so the discovery of this text, in fact, pushes the name back centuries. We can no longer attribute the um, incompatibility of Isa and Yeshua or Yeshua, Yeshua to um, the early Islamic community. It goes back further if this identification is correct. Okay, thank you. So you have, uh, you seem to have inspired some people to start their Googling mid-lecture. Uh, and so there are some questions about, is there a major electronic index or source for these kinds of, of languages? Is there an online uh, repository, something that's maybe mapped or geo-referenced so people can explore a little bit on their own? Uh, yes, there are two uh, two resources for North and South. The North one, the online corpus of the inscriptions of ancient North Arabia. You can type that into Google and find it. And that has the inscriptions, the Safedic inscriptions and the North Arabian inscriptions. And the digital archive, uh, Dasi, for the uh, study of the inscriptions of Arabia. I can't remember what the rest of it was. Sorry about that. But Dasi, uh, but that's for the South Arabian inscriptions. Yeah, digital. Yeah. And so there, and, and that one's a host in Italy. Oceana is in the UK out of Oxford. Yeah. And we, we will collect those references for those interested and make sure to link them on Facebook or in the comments in YouTube once we get everything there so that people can explore. Okay, we're well, going to take some more questions here. Um, would anybody assume the um, Safaitic, the Safaitic predates Christianity out of an absence of mentions? Um, I think you have, uh, so you, you have references to events that, that, that happened in, in uh, the first century BC. So you can say that the inscription, and then of course you have the archeological evidence. The real question, I think, and this is, a, this is a, probably a different way of thinking about it. The, um, the ancient North Arabian inscriptions, we can say this, um, uh, date back to the middle of the first millennium BCE in North Arabia, perhaps earlier, um, but for sure to the middle of the first millennium BCE. Now, the development of this script type of other early North Arabian scripts, which we call vaguely Thamudic or Oasis North Arabian into Safiatic, is a discussion of letter shapes. When did the letter shapes develop in such a way that we now call them Safiatic? But when we look to other things like formulae, um, structure of prayer, structures of expression, vocabulary, there seems to be a continued tradition that dates back from to the middle of the first millennium BCE until the Safiatic period, whenever that ends, um, of, uh, of, of, um, of writing formulae and of, uh, and of style. So we might simply be talking about a continuous use of a script type, of a type and very broadly speaking, that um, uh, in these areas. And the definition of Safiatic simply comes down to when do we start calling these letter shapes Safiatic? And indeed, the difference, be there, are, there are some groups of Safiatic inscriptions, what we call the 90 degree script, where the difference between that and Thamudic B is, which is a, a much older script, we think it goes back to the middle of the first millennium BCE. The difference between the two is really hard to tell sometimes, and sometimes it could be either. So we are looking at a, a gradient or a spectrum, yeah. So there's a couple of questions related to what the inscriptions can tell us about the people and the place. Uh, what the inscriptions tell us about literacy among the groups of people here, these pastoralists? Is there a way to measure? Is there understanding? Is there other comparative contemporary data? Ah, uh, yes, literacy. Um, the, uh, there, there, there certainly seems to be um, more literacy than was expected, but that's because our general idea about literacy in, uh, in pre-Islamic Arabia is that, well, very few people could read or produce, read and write, right? So that's the general idea about the pre-Islamic period, the Jahiliya, is that most people could not read and write. There was a, uh, uh, and so the discovery of all these inscriptions is, is shocking already from that perspective. Now, the question of literacy has, is, is tied to the question of chronology. Insofar as you can look at the amount of inscriptions that you see, okay, in the landscape and say, this is a huge number, that huge number really depends on the time dimension. And since we don't know the time dimension, it's really hard to say how 
you know, definitely it's how widespread writing was. Because if you have, and this is an argument I think um, Peter Ackerman's made in print somewhere, uh, if you have, uh, 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 you know, 30,000 texts over 300 years, it's very different than 30,000 texts over 800 years. And so it's very difficult to say without the time dimension pinned down how widespread writing was, but it does, but there, we, we, there was no one, there were no institutions or formal institutions and such. So there could be institutions, that's a tricky term, but no formal institutions as such where we would say that you have a scribal, a, 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 a scribal class, a special group of people that were trained as scribes. Writing seems to, and Michael McDonald hypothesized that Latin writing was passed on informally, taught from person to person. But it's important to emphasize this, while it was passed on inform, informally, the, uh, the, the structure of the inscription, the formulae, what you could say in an inscription was very rigid. So it wasn't that they just learned the alphabet, but they learned how and what to write. They didn't simply write whatever came to their minds. They followed very strict formulaic genres. And so that's why we know a lot about certain things and almost nothing about other subjects because they followed very strict um, writing formula. There are exceptions and those exceptions are, pre are precious, but, very, but, 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 but generally speaking, they followed very strict uh, writing um, uh, formulae. Yeah. So if they're following these formulae, there must be some centralized-ish way of, of obtaining the knowledge, right? Yes, yeah, so I would think that it, it would be productive to compare it to the way, let's say, poetry um, must have been taught and reproduced in, in, in among the pre-Islamic nomads. So if you think about poetry, it's very, it's, it follows very similar themes. You have uh, meters and rhyme and meter set structures, established meters that you have to follow in rhymes. There are no schools as such that you went to. These were simply regulated by usage. But... When you compose a poem, a poem should look in a certain way, and therefore you have to follow one of the established meters, you have to use the rhyme, and you need to uh, follow a certain structure as well. And so it seems that the inscriptions would have been taught in a similar kind of way. Um, I think that that's probably a good comparison. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I'm going to regret taking this privilege is that you stumbled into an area I study is chronology. And I'm curious, had there been uh, archaeological scientific attempts to date, for example, you mentioned there's always there's often dung in the areas around where these are collected, uh, or taking AMS samples from around the 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 layers around the lake beds, or uh, I can think of any number of others. Are there people trying to sort out those finer points? Since the chronology is such an open question, the real trick though is associating whatever you date with the inscription itself. So for example, uh, you might date, so you, you might find a burial okay, that one excavates and you uh, uh, can date the remains, but how, and then there might be Safiotic inscriptions at the site as well. But the only way to link the two is if the Safiotic inscription directly references the grave and says that this is the burial of so-and-so. And so far, no burial with an associated Safiotic inscription has been discovered to date in such a way. Okay. Um, there are, are lots of inscriptions. Mm -hmm. Around the edges of these lakes, are there any sort of accretions from when the lakes have risen and dropped that overlap on the on the inscriptions? Because I know with the, in the, these accretions, if there's enough carbon in them, they can be dated. That's interesting. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any examples personally, but that's a very interesting thing to look into. I know, for example, this seasonal lake that we went to, the Avayat, the cairn where the inscriptions were at were you know, a good 300 meters or so from the lake. So yeah, the yeah, so they're a bit further. So you would basically take your animals down. I suppose somebody at the camp would be a bit further away and that's where they were producing the inscriptions. Um, what's fascinating here though, is uh, uh, there are, I, I think that there are opportunities, um, you know, with further uh, surveying to find undisturbed burials where this might be possible. But the reason why, and this is something that's interesting to point out, the reason why it's so difficult to find undisturbed structures or burials is because the area is uh, in constant use. The same people who still inhabit, still use the same areas. And so when you go to a site with a lot of Safedic inscriptions, um, the inscriptions can be thrown around. They look like they're just written on any rocks and just thrown about. But I'm becoming more and more convinced that that's because they're not in their original context. So this, in 2019, we actually discovered a beautiful site that seems to have been undisturbed. One of the good reasons to think it's undisturbed was there's no cigarette packaging around or anything. So there's nothing, no, no evidence for at least recent uh, uh, people being there. Um, and the Safiotic inscriptions that in other sites look like they're thrown about were beautifully arranged into sort of a panel and in, in a, um, an enclosure. 
And they formed a structure. And we found out that the structure was in fact a funerary structure. And that the word that we have been translating as enclosure elsewhere, because these things have been found out of context, in fact, referred to a certain funerary installation. And that because we found it in context, it was in fact a funerary installation. It wasn't just a rock talking about an enclosure for animals. Now that is a unique find so far. Um, but uh, so, and, and you have to go into the really the deepest parts to, 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 to find places such as these. So hopefully there's an opportunity if, a, if an undisturbed grave is found in such a context that we could get uh, uh, a real date that would fit with an inscription that we could. Um, you know. Isn't it wonderful when archeology span and linguistics play nice together? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I have some, we have some more questions here. Uh, about the northern and southern versions. We're asking, is there a connection between these two, uh, between these two types? Um, and if, what's the difference? Yes. Um, South Safiric is a term that uh, was used, I guess it reached its height in the 80s to refer to what we today call the Hismaic inscriptions. Um, it is what also appears in the literature as Thamudic E. Um, these texts uh, occur in the Hisma, in um, Wadi Rom area, um, and they can be found as far north as Madaba. They are related, and so they, they seem to be from the same time period. They are not the same script, and they actually reflect two very different writing traditions. And this is why I'm a, uh, this is why I say that these the scripts come with established writing traditions, because you have two ancient North Arabian alphabet types at the same time, uh, time period, but the things that they express are very, very different. And they follow very different kind of uh, ways to structure the inscriptions and the genres, the subjects that they, they talk about in the inscriptions are actually quite different. And so it seems that these reflect different communities and different writing traditions. One using a script that we call Hismaic and it's distinguished from Safiric in terms of its letter shapes and the values that certain letter shapes have. And the other that we call Safiric, which is concentrated in the Hagra. Yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna take one more here. Uh, you mentioned that some combination of the Safiatic letters as meaning a common indication of prayer. Has anyone or you tried, have tried to check whether the Quranic, quote, unexplained letter combinations at the beginning of specific surahs could be Safiatic in origin or have an uh, indication of meaning? I haven't seen anything that would shed light on those, unfortunately. It would be exciting, but I haven't uh, seen anything that sheds light on, on that. We have lots of inscriptions we don't understand, but I think that comes from the fact that we, and especially in the Thamudic inscriptions, but I think that comes more from the fact that we just simply don't have enough material to understand those languages rather than they being magical combinations of letters. So I don't think we have anything that would shed light on what's going on in the Quran, yeah. Okay. Well, we thank you very much. We have a great many other uh, questions still here, but I will uh, direct folks to, as you, as you offered, to email you and contact you directly here. And uh, we thank you, Professor Al-Jalan, for your time tonight and for this exciting discovery. We hope to see it in print. And when it does, we'll make sure to get it linked on to our webpage and back to this lecture uh, so everybody can follow up on the finer points. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It's really our pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.